In episode five, Serena wakes up in the Wheeler household the next day, heads downstairs, and she's greeted by Ezra, who showed up to check on her. She asks about the whereabouts for Mr. Wheeler because she still hasn't met him yet, and she wants to thank him for his hospitality and whatnot. But Ezra tells her that he's really busy. He'll try to set up a meeting with him, but his schedule's just pretty booked at the moment. She then heads into the dining room where Alanis has set up a feast for breakfast. After the thank yous get out of the way, Serena tells her, we'll have that center back up and running in no time. Serena's not ready to let a few rules get in the way of, quote, God's will. Other than that, Serena doesn't do a damn thing that day. Well, the next day, Alanis has set up a little bit of a brunch with other women of like mind. And they, just like Alanis, are completely starstruck around Serena. They start showing their support, telling her about themselves. But when the baby kicks, they all get around her and start touching her stomach. She can't help but think back to when Gilead first started. The handmaids weren't even a thing. It was just adopting children from, quote, unfit parents. Back then, the wives and the commanders, they were still trying the natural way. And to see where she is now, it's quite a jump. She does have to step away because Alanis tells her that she has a call. It's from Gilead. But when Alanis steps out of the room, Serena tells her that she can be on the call and that Gilead would probably love to hear from her. And that is something that Alanis just laughs off telling Serena wives shouldn't burden themselves with business things. She then hops on the call, and it's a little bit surprising because it's not just Commander Lawrence. It's also Commander Putnam as well. The topic of conversation is what happened at the center. Commander Putnam especially is annoyed at how the whole thing played out. This has already been very expensive for Gilead, and now they've just got an empty building and bad press. Serena explains that she can't be responsible for the actions of refugees, and heaps all of the blame on June. It's Commander Lawrence who gets the topic back on track by saying, all of that aside, we're still planning on opening up the center again. But Serena's had some ideas on that, and she thinks that focusing on Gilead is a mistake. Lawrence especially is a little bit confused, because it's the Gilead Information Center. It should probably have to do with Gilead. But Serena says, I think we should focus on fertility and conception. It's all about the babies. That's all people want to hear about. The Gilead Information Center, that's always going to be a magnet for attack. But a fertility center, all about children, it's hard to be against that. Lawrence tells her it's an interesting idea. He seems open to it, but Commander Putnam seems absolutely closed-minded and hangs up on Serena, just telling her, we'll take it into account. Once they get off the phone, Putnam chalks up his behavior to keeping Serena in line. But it turns out Serena wasn't the only person who had grand ideas. Lawrence did as well. He's got this idea called New Bethlehem, where they basically just welcome back everybody, opening up the borders. But Commander Putnam hates it. He looks at it like you're welcoming back traitors and criminals and rapists and terrorists. And he tells Lawrence that the other commanders are never going to support this. But Lawrence gets blunt with them and tells them that if they keep the borders up and the country closed, the country will die. And everything they've worked for would have been for nothing. Putnam, however, in a very smug tone, says, yeah, that speech isn't going to work, and he walks out. With the rest of her day in front of her, though, Serena heads outside, and she sees that she's getting a lot of flowers from well-wishers. Ezra is there kind of managing everything, and when Serena asks about going up and talking to one particular woman, Ezra tells her, you can't. We don't know who she is, and we don't know what she wants, so why don't you just go enjoy the grounds? To somebody who didn't know the full story, you might think Serena was a prisoner. But when she gets back in the house, she finally gets that one-on-one with Mr. Wheeler. He apologizes for being so busy and not being able to meet with her. But then he tells her that he talked to the commanders about her proposal. And they're going to move forward with it. He even calls it a real stroke of genius. She starts talking about going back to the center, settling in, starting work. But Wheeler tells her that's not necessary. She'll have input, of course, but she's also very pregnant. And most pregnancies require bed rest. As he's leaving, she asks him to get her a cell phone so she could at least conduct some business. But he tells her there's too many security concerns to do that. So for the time being, she is pregnant and stuck in this house and can't leave. All she has to do is grab a red cloak and a white bonnet. But with her former handmaid, June gets woken up in the middle of the night by a phone call. And it's from Lily. A guardian is coming across the border with information on wife school, so... 
her, Luke, and Moira get in the car, and they drive to go meet with Lily and hopefully the Guardian. On the way to the woods, though, they do encounter some anti-refugee protesters. There's a lot of people in Canada that don't want them there. But once they get to Lily, they find out that they made that trip for nothing. She explains that the Guardian is stuck in no man's land. They've really beefed up security on the border, and it's just not safe for him to cross at the moment. He put up the signal that he was stuck and wasn't coming, and unfortunately for June and Luke and Moira, they'd already left at that point. It's so bad that Lily's going to have to move her outpost to somewhere else. But Luke isn't willing to let this be a waste of time. He tells them, I'm going to go over. Everything we want to know about Hannah is just over there. So I'm going to go get it. And while it's not safe at all, June decides to go with them. So Lily draws them a map on where to meet with this guardian and lets the guardian know that the couple are on their way. They then head off, cross the border, and now they're back in Gilead. It takes them a while. They start at dusk and they walk through the night. June starts getting flashbacks of when they fled the first time. And as they're walking to meet with the guardian, Lily and Moira just sit in the cabin getting drunk, waiting for their return. Eventually, though, the next day, they do end up getting to the rendezvous point, meeting up with the Guardian, giving him the code word, but it's pretty clear he is spooked. He tells the group that it's not safe where they currently are and they have to follow him. At first, Luke and June have absolutely no interest in doing that. They just want to get the information and get back. But he tells them, I'm leaving, so you can either follow me and get that information or you could just head back to where you came without it. They, of course, follow him. And he leads them to an empty bowling alley that he really uses as a hangout. They're pretty surprised because it's got electricity, it's got a bathroom. Hell, it's even got beer. I mean, this Guardian is a very accommodating host. He gives them the information they came for, telling them that Hannah, or what she's referred to now as a plum, is in a wife's school where they're basically just taught to be wives. And this school goes by pretty quickly. They want to get them in, teach them, and then get them matched up to be a wife. The fact that they saw her on TV still wearing plum purple is a sign that she hasn't been matched up yet. Both Luke and June are completely disgusted because Hannah is 12 years old. But the good thing is that these wives schools are for the best of the best, and the girls are at least treated well. The Guardian then explains that everything about the wives school is kept under lock and key. It's pretty covert, pretty secret. And then he hands over a flash drive telling them that everything they have on the wife's schools are on the flash drive. Luke and June are really appreciative. They thank him. They turn to leave and he says, where are you going? You can't leave now. You'll get caught. It's crazy to leave during the day. You might as well just sit here, lay low for a bit, and then we'll leave at night. I can guide you back. And while June really wants to get back home, everything the guy said made a lot of sense. So they decide to stay. And they end up really liking him. At one point, June tells Luke he's unlike anybody I've ever met in Gilead. He's so pure. So he's a very unique guy. Luke actually likes him so much that he does the one thing he's not supposed to do, exchange names. And the name of the Guardian is Jaden. But eventually, it comes time to leave, and they head out. And Jaden knew a way quicker path, but it was also a more dangerous path because he ends up stepping on a landmine, and it goes off. It doesn't kill him right away, he's still alive, and June and Luke go and tend to him, but he warns them, you gotta get out of here, it's gonna draw attention, and sure enough, it does. They're not too far from the border, and they take off running. But that explosion drew a lot of attention, and they end up getting caught and separated. Thank you so much for checking out this recap, please consider subscribing to the channel and subscribing to my Patreon. Hit thumbs up if you liked it, smash that thumbs down button if you thought it sucked, If you left a comment, I don't get back to you. I usually don't check the comments unless they're like a super comment. Also, if you don't see the next video up on the end screen, not to worry. It'll be up in a day or two.